Yeah. Wow. 
Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. I said somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Alpha, Omega. Alpha, Omega. You are worthy of our praises today. You are worthy of our praises today. Alpha.
that song again. And I want you to sing it like you know what you're singing about. Like you know that God is a great God. Sing it like you know that God can do miracles. Oh, you are great. You know me. because you're the one who do it wonders. Thank you because you do it great things without number. Oh Lord, we exalt you, we magnify your name, oh Lord. We give you adoration and praises. And that's why we've come today to worship you in your presence, oh Lord. We give you honor. You are great. the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you because you're still alive. And we thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have given us a Savior, Master, Lord, Healer, Deliverer, is all we need. We're asking, O oh Lord, as we come to the Bible study tonight, we'll really study your word. 
and everything you have for us in your word will be of benefit to everyone in Jesus' name. Enrich our understanding. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to behold great and wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Be all we need tonight. And we pray, Lord, that our faith will take hold of your word and will have everything you provide for every one of us in Jesus' name. Touch our hearts. Touch our nature. Touch our habits. Touch our character. Touch our attitude. Touch everything within us that, Lord, today we will be closer and nearer unto you in Jesus' name. Lift us higher in the spirit and in spiritual things in Jesus' name. Lord, whatever has hindered us in the past from making progress, we pray that you cut off everything from our life tonight in Jesus' name. Be honored, be exalted, and be glorified in every one of our lives tonight. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, I welcome you to our Bible study tonight. In our Bible study, we're looking at Mark chapter 3. And I'm reading to you from verse 1 all through to verse 6. Mark chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he will heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he says unto the, unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he says unto them, Is it lawful to do good on, this, on the Sabbath days? Or to do evil, to save life, or to kill. But they held their peace. They were just watching. They wanted to know what you all do. And they held their peace. They couldn't answer that simple question, straightforward question, whether it is right, whether it's lawful, whether it's good, whether it's righteous, to do good on Sabbath days, or to do evil. Everybody should know that the answer. To kill or to make a lie, to save life. They held their peace then in verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he says unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Tonight we're looking at those six verses of Scripture. Already you understand, we learned last week. As you look at the closing verses of chapter 2, that Jesus is Lord. Look at verse 20. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord. And we need to take that in. We need to understand that. That Jesus Christ is Lord. is Lord of angels and men. He is Lord of heaven and earth. Lord over the whole universe. is the Lord of glory. Jesus is Lord. They need to understand that, and that was their problem. Because they looked at Jesus Christ like one of the Jewish people and one of the Hebrew people. They didn't see him higher than themselves. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, 
and giving him a name which is above every name. It's above the Sanhedrin. It's above the Pharisees. It's above the Sadducees. It's above the religious people of that time. It's above the religious people of this day. The Father, the Heavenly Father, has given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Everything in the whole universe, everything in our world, everything in the past, everything in the present, everything in the future, everything up above, everything up below. The Father has given him a name above them all. Look at verse 11. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody say Amen. Is the Lord of heaven and earth. Is the Lord of glory. And is the Lord that blesses everyone who calls on him in faith today. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I read from verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, But we will speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, before the uh, world, unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. The princes of this world, the religious leaders of this world, and the religious hierarchy of this world, they didn't know. Then it says, for I didn't know it, they would not have crucified, tell me, the Lord of glory. He is the Lord of glory. Not only the Lord of the Sabbath, is the Lord of heaven and earth. The major problem with those Pharisees was that they did not recognize who Jesus was. And there are many people today who do not recognize who Jesus is. The Christ, the Savior, the Master, the Lord. They wanted him to be under their tradition. They wanted him to be under the Sanhedrin. They wanted him to be under their authority. They wanted him to be under their interpretation of the law. And because he, do, he couldn't do that, and he wouldn't do that, that's why they had the problem they had. But thank God that we know that Jesus is Lord. I said Jesus is Lord. And tonight as we look at the passage we are studying, we are looking at the topic, Christ's power to heal despite the critic's presence. Christ's power to heal despite the critic's presence. The three things we're looking at, number one, the accusation and the grudge of hypocrites blinded by hatred. The accusation of and the grudge of hypocrites blinded by hatred. We're coming back to Mark chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. He had been there before, and here was another Sabbath day, and Jesus entered again in, on that Sabbath day. And we're told of what, we, what he did. He taught them. He taught the word of God. And they watched him. Whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day. That they might accuse him. And then in verse 3 it says. And he said to the man which had the withered hand. Stand forth. As you look at Jesus Christ, you understand that Jesus Christ was committed to just one thing, doing the will of the Father. If it pleased the Pharisees, all right. 
If it displeased them, all right. But one thing he was committed to, doing the will of the Father. He knew what the Father had sent him to do on earth. And he knew the commission the Father God in heaven had given unto him. He was given the word to teach. And so as he entered the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, their synagogue, he taught them again. And let's look at Luke chapter 6. And I'm reading from verses 6 and 7. What Jesus did and what Jesus expects us to do on the Lord's day, whenever we come together, and whenever we come together like this to study the word, to search the word, to understand the word, what he wants us to do, and what he has committed into our hands. I pray we'll be faithful as he was faithful in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. You know, Luke is reporting the same thing. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. It was on the Sabbath day. A man was there having withered hand. And before paying attention to the withered hand, he taught the word of God. And the Father has spoken to me, so I speak. And then in verse 7, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him whether he will heal on the Sabbath day or that they might find an accusation against him. They watched him so that they'll find an accusation in Luke chapter 4. Reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 4. I'm reading here from verse 15. It tells us in verse 15, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. He taught them, what was he teaching? Repentance. What was he teaching? The entrance into the kingdom of God. What was he teaching? Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, to read the scriptures unto them. Look at verse 31 of that same chapter 4. It says, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. On the Sabbath days, he never missed it, the purpose of his coming, and the purpose what the Father sent him, and what the Father wanted him to do, he taught them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with his power. As he teaches us by spirit today, I pray his word will be with power in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 47. Luke 19 verse 47, and he taught daily in their temple. The most important thing, the teaching of the word of God. He taught daily in their temple. The priority of his ministry, he taught daily in the temple but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him our lord jesus christ the teacher come from heaven kept to his commission despite great opposition the pharisees sought as they always did how they might catch something from him how they might accuse him but that did not stop the Lord, did not deter the Lord, did not hinder the Lord. He was looking at the objective of his coming every time courageously, consistently. 
he became a model uncompromisingly he continued his ministry and he is our pattern today i pray that you will take him as a pattern of your life in jesus name let's come back now to mark chapter 3 and look at verse 4 mark chapter 3 verse 4 remember we're looking at the accusation and the grudge of hypocrites blinded by hatred the hatred that blinded them they couldn't see that it's good to do good whether it's on the sabbath day on the lord's day or any other day that the purpose of our life should be doing good and so now in verse 4 it was going to put them to the test it was going to call them to reasoning it was going to judge them out of their religious tradition look at verse 4 and he says unto them is it lawful is it right is it righteous is it befitting such a day like this to do good or to do evil on the sabbath day is it all right to save lives or to kill but they held their peace come to luke chapter 14. in luke chapter 14 we're reading from verse 1 and they should have known the answer to the question that jesus posed to them luke chapter 14 verse 1 and it came to pass as they went into the house of one of the chief pharisees to eat bread on the sabbath day that they watched him whether it was in the temple or it's in the house anywhere he was on the sabbath day they'll watch him what's he going to do and behold there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy paralysis now and jesus answered speak unto the lawyers and the pharisees saying is it lawful to heal on the sabbath days they were always confronted with those questions with that kind of question is it all right is it righteous is it permissible is it lawful to heal on a sabbath day and he held their peace as usual and he took him and healed him and let him go and he took him and healed him and he let him go that's what he'll do for you whatever sickness whatever infirmity and whatever agent of satan might be tied to your life he took him he healed him and he let him go i didn't hear your amen look at verse 5 and answered them saying which of you shall have an ass or an ox falling into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the sabbath day and they could not answer him again to these things he said if you have an animal that belongs to you and is falling into a pit on the sabbath day what are you going to do are you going to leave it there or are you going to pull him out the answer was they'll pull out that ass or ox whatever because it belongs to them well all these souls belong to him if they will do that to their animal he'll do this to the one he has created that is under the power of the evil one we're looking at luke chapter 11 and we're looking at verse 53 luke chapter 11 and i'm reading here from verse 53 and as she said these things unto them the scribes and the pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might do what accuse him chapter 13 of luke reading from verse 13 luke chapter 13 reading from verse 13 and he laid his hands on her and immediately immediately somebody help me shout immediately his power has not changed 
as he was yesterday, so he is today, and so he will ever be until we see him face to face. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it says immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, with wrath, with anger, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to walk. In them, in those six days, therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Verse 15, the Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, does not each of you, each one of you, on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? In verse 16, and ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these eighteen years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries, religious adversaries, all his adversaries, adversaries committed to tradition, they were not committed to helping people, all his adversaries were shamed. And all the people rejoice for all the glorious things that were done by him. Let's come back to that question in Mark chapter 3. Reading from verse 4. Mark chapter 3, reading from verse 4. It says in verse 4, and it says unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days? Or to do evil, to save life, or to kill, but he held their peace. We also must be confronted with that kind of question. We must ask ourselves on the Lord's day, on the holy day, on a study day like this, on a revival day, on a workers' meeting day, any day that we count special. Any day that we think it's not the usual thing to do this or to do that, is it all right? Is it righteous? Is it lawful? Is it uh, okay to heal on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day, or to kill or to destroy? Why was he asking that? On the Sabbath day, they were plotting to kill him. And he was saying, is it all right? On the Sabbath day, they were planning and they were consulting together how they will destroy him, how they will kill him, how they will do evil. He said, this is the Sabbath day, and it's the day you set apart, and yet on such a day like this, you are, pl you are planning to kill me. You are plotting to destroy me. Is that lawful? I am planning to do good. I am planning to save life. I am planning to heal, but you are planning to do evil. I will do good. On the Lord's day, I will do good. Every day, I will do good. That's what the Lord expects of you, expects of me. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Matthew chapter 5, we're reading from verse 44. And I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good. Look at that, underline that, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Why? Verse 45, that she may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust do good every time every day every opportunity do good to friends to foes to neighbors to enemies to co-workers do good any day every day it is lawful it is right to do good in luke chapter 6 verse 35 luke chapter 6 
reading from verse 35. In verse 35, Jesus said, But love your enemies and do good. Love your enemies and do good. You don't count them as enemies. If they count themselves as your enemies, do good unto them. That's what we are for. That's why we're born again, so that we can continue in good works in what Christ would have done. And Christ died for everyone. Do good and lend open for nothing again. And lend open for, open for nothing again. The people you don't think will repay you. And the people you don't think will be able to do good unto you. Even if they cannot help you, they cannot do good unto you. You are not hoping for any other sin. And it says, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind and good unto the unthankful and unto the evil. We will do good. Galatians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 6. Reading from verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. As we have opportunity, might be a Monday or a Wednesday, might be a Thursday or a Friday, might be a Saturday or on the Lord's Day on Sunday. As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. It tells us in James chapter 4, reading from verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. Well, to do good. And if we don't, when we could, we'll not be doing right. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, tell me, Say it now. I'm going to read that again. You read that part. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, complete it. To him it is sin. Let's come back to the question of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 4. Mark chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 4. And he says unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? You are planning evil. Is that good in the sight of God? You are plotting evil. Is that good in the sight of the Lord? And you are imagining evil in your heart on the Sabbath day. Am I the guilty one doing good or are you the guilty one doing evil? Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? It is unlawful, it is sinful to do evil. It is unlawful, it is, so, it is sinful any day, any time to do evil. In Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 9, Romans chapter 2, and we're reading here from verse 9. In Romans chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Whether on the Sabbath day, or ordinary day, or on the Lord's day, whether in the temple, in the sanctuary, or outside the sanctuary, outside the temple, whether amidst the people of God or in the midst of Gentiles outsiders, it says in that verse 9, there'll be tribulation, there'll be anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. And then in Second Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verses 8, and nine second corinthians chapter 13 verses 7 and 8 rather now i pray to god that she do no evil i pray to god that she do no evil you will not do evil 
either carelessly or deliberately, you will not do evil. You forget yourself and you forget the commandments of God, you will not do evil. The nature in you, if you are born again, the nature in you, if you are a child of God, will not allow us to do evil. Now I pray to God that she do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest. Though we be as reprobates, for we can do nothing against the truth. If we walk against the truth, we're doing evil. If we plot against the truth, we're doing evil. If we conspire against the truth, we're doing evil. If we want to overthrow, overturn the truth, we're doing evil. It says, for we can do nothing, we should do nothing against the truth. But for the truth. First Peter chapter 3. I read from verse 12. First Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 12. It says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, the prayers of the righteous. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. It's not right to do evil. It doesn't show we are born again when we do evil. It doesn't show we understand the presence of the Lord and the Lord is watching our lives when we do evil. And it says his face is set against the people that do evil. So John, so John, only one chapter, Reading from verse 11. Third John, verse 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil. Don't copy the people that do evil. Something is wrong with their spiritual lives. And something is wrong with their relationship to God. Something is wrong with their understanding you know, of their Christian calling. And it says, if you understand your own Christian calling, beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil has not seen God. A final day, judgment day is coming, and those who do evil, they'll go to the left hand side and those who do good because they are born again and because they have the grace of God in their lives, those who do good, they'll go to the right hand side. We're looking at John chapter 5. John chapter 5, I read from verse 28. John chapter 5, verse 28. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good, you see this, unto the resurrection of life. Those who are born again, those who have the grace of God in their lives, and those whose lives, whose characters and habits have changed, have turned around, and have been transformed because of that new birth. And because of that righteous life, coming out of that new birth, they've done good and they will come to the resurrection of life. The latter part of verse 29, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I pray that will not be your Lord. I said that will not be your Lord. The accusation and the grudge of hypocrites blinded by hatred. Let's come back to Mark chapter 3. I'm reading now from the first part of verse 5. Mark chapter 3, and I'm reading from the first part of verse 5. It says in this first part of verse 5, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved, for the hardness of their hearts. Stop there for a moment. There are many people that misunderstand this verse of scripture. And they say, 
We're to walk in the steps of Christ. That's right. We're to do whatever Christ has done. Well, that's right. And here, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, he was angry at them. And he looked at them, and for the hardness of their heart, he was grieved. You need to understand that you are not exactly like Jesus. He is Christ, you are not. He is Lord, you are not. He is Emmanuel, God with us, you are not. He is creator. By, by him, all things were made. Everything that exists, everything was made by him. He was his creator. You are not. He's the final judge. The father has committed all judgment into his son. But you are not a judge like that. Christ is equal to the father. But you are not. Christ is the ruler of Israel and the king of Israel. You are not. His name is above every name under, he under heaven, every name on earth, but you are not. Look at that verse again. And when he, Christ, the creator, Christ, the savior, Christ, the Lord, Christ, the final judge, had looked round about on them with anger, divine anger. Is the Creator's anger, is the Lord's anger, is Emmanuel's anger, is the one that is higher than everyone. He is not human, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as a final judge, he looked around about him with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart. Here, you see that there's a lot of things that Jesus did. That you cannot say, I am like Jesus, I'm going to do that as God, he walked on the water. You don't. As creator, he cursed the fig tree. You can't. As Lord, he accepted the worship of men and angels. You cannot. As the lion of the tribe of Judah, he rebuked and redeemed Israel. You don't. As the smiting stone that came out of that mountain is going to crush the rebellious nations and kingdoms you want at the final authority he will condemn and damn all the repentant nations and people you cannot and there is one area you cannot follow after and you cannot say he looked at them and he was grieved and he was angry so i too can be angry no you cannot let's look at the thing say number one the hardness of their heart the hardness of their heart we're looking at zechariah chapter 7 zechariah chapter 7 and i'm reading from verse 12 zechariah chapter 7 we're reading from verse 12 in verse 12 look at what the word of god says it says yea they made their hearts as an adamant stone lest they should hear the law and that and the words which the lord of hosts have sent in his spirit by the former prophets therefore came a great wrath from the lord of hosts they had hardness of heart and their hearts was like adam and stone therefore the anger of god the wrath of god the indignation of god came upon them verse 13 therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear so they cried and i will not hear says the lord not the prophet, not the prophet. The prophet cannot say, I will not hear you. The priest cannot say, I will not hear you. The pastor cannot say, I will not hear you. Because you have hardness of heart. That's in the hand of the Almighty God alone. That they had hardness of heart. And he looked at them. He is the Savior. He could have saved them. He is the one that brought forgiveness to them. 
because they will not receive that salvation and that forgiveness he wanted to open the doors of heaven for them so they could get to heaven and because they will not that hardness of heart made him to act like the heavenly father god would have acted we're coming to john chapter 12 john chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 40 john chapter 12 we're reading from verse 40 he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand what they had and be converted and that i should heal them and because they rejected his grace and they rejected the sealing virtue and they rejected the conversion they could have had and they rejected the privilege of getting to heaven he was great like god and he was angry with them god is angry at the wicked every day like god would have been angry we're looking at hebrews chapter 3 hebrews chapter 3 god the creator has the right to be angry with those who are hardened and with those who are adamant you don't have that right i don't have that right he is creator you are not he is the final judge you are not in hebrews chapter 3 i read from verse 7 in verse 7 wherefore as the holy ghost says today if he will hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years it tells us in verse 12 take heed brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Paul the apostle could only warn them. He couldn't get angry at them. He couldn't say you are hardened therefore I am angry. No the apostle cannot do that. The preacher cannot say, you are hiding, so I am angry. No, the preacher cannot do that. It says, lest any of you shall be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, and how be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not of them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not, so we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. We're coming to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, it says, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he was grieved. What kind of grief is that? It's the grief of the Creator, it's the grief of the Lord of Lords. And the king of kings is the grief of God himself. And this is not an area where you'll say, I'll copy him. He was grieved. And when he was grieved, he was angry at them. You cannot copy this one. This is the prerogative of God Almighty himself. Let's come to Genesis chapter 5, chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 
defiled. And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. That's God. God is the creator, and God is the almighty. And there are things that his creatures will do. There are things that people who profess that they know God will do, and it will grieve him. And when it grieves him, he expresses that grief with judgment. You cannot. You are not creator, and you are not judge. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping sin, and the fowls of the air. For it repented me, it grieved me, that I have made them. That's how the flood came on the whole earth. You cannot bring a flood on the whole earth. Only God can do that. Only God can be so grieved because they were his creatures and they didn't do that which was right. They imagined evil and they did evil. Every sin, every sin. And God was grieved with them. We're looking at Psalm 95. Psalm 95, I'm reading here from verse 8. Psalm 95 verse 8, had it not your heart, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, verse 10, 40 years long, was I grieved with that generation. 40 years long was I, the Almighty God, grieved with this generation and said, it's a people that do hear in their heart and that have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath, in my anger, in my indignation, that they should not enter into my rest. Now you cannot swear in your wrath and say, so and so will not get to heaven. So and so will not get to rest. Only God can do that. Only God can close the door against anyone or open the door for anyone. Let's come back to Mark chapter 3. We're reading from verse 5. Mark chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, And when he had looked round about on them, with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart. Number one was seeing the hardness of their heart, their adamant stony heart. And we've seen how that grieved the Lord. Now we're looking at the anger. Again, understand the anger here is the anger of the only begotten Son of God. He is the only one that has right to manifest this kind of anger. Uh, let's come to Psalm 2. I'm reading from Psalm 2. You see what the prophecy says about the Lord, not about you, about Jesus Christ. It says in Psalm 2, I'm reading from verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. He's talking to the son, Jesus Christ. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. That's not talking to you. He's talking to Christ. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Look at this, look at this, verse 12. Kiss the Son. That's Jesus, capital S. Kiss the Son. Bend down to the Son. 
humble yourself be before the Son. Believe in the Son. Embrace the Son. Kiss the Son. Lest he be angry. Lest he be angry. Believe on him. Take him as your Savior. Take him as your Lord. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. It was already prophesied that when he sees when he sees some believers or sinners that are hiding themselves that will not kiss the sun that will not believe the sun they will make his anger against sin and against sinners to rise up it says let's see perish in the way when his wrath his anger is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him you will trust the Lord. You believe the Lord. You will not allow his anger as judge to come upon your life. If you reject him as savior, then you are going to face him as judge. Psalm 110. In Psalm 110, look at verse 1. The Lord, that's the Heavenly Father, said unto my Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the writing of the Lord there, capital L-O-R-D. That's the Father. And then capital L, but a low case, L-R-O-R-D. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou or at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Look at verse 5. The Lord... The Lord here, from what I explained to you from verse 1, who is this Lord in verse 5? I said, who is this Lord in verse 5? I want to hear the class. Who is this Lord in verse 5? The Lord Jesus, the Lord at the right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath in the day of his anger in the day of his indignation it was not just you know all of his sudden days was happening and jesus was getting angry at them it was prophesied and it will fulfill the scripture that when they saw sinners that were adamant in their sin he must be angry at their sin he must be angry at their hardness of heart it was prophesied and it fulfilled it we're looking at uh, psalm uh, we're looking at psalm 21 in psalm 21 i'm reading from verse 8 psalm 21 we're looking at verse 8. In verse 8, here is what it says. It says, Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fairy oven in the time of thine anger. It, they look forward to a Christ that will come. A Messiah that will come, that will not smile at their sin, that will not smile at their evil, that will not smile at their hardness of heart. Already it was prophesied that when he comes, there will be the time of his anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. For they intended evil against thee. They imagine a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. Therefore shall thou make them turn their back and when thou shalt make ready thine arrows upon their, thy strings against the face of them. And so we understand the grief of the Lord Jesus Christ here was the grief of Creator God, the grief of the only begotten Son of God, and the grief of the final judge. The anger you see here is the anger of the final judge, of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords, of the Creator of heaven and earth. 
Let's come back now to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at verses five and six. The second part of verse five. Look at the second part of verse five now. It says, and it says unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. After he had looked on them, and he saw their hardness of heart, and was grieved at that, and he showed them the anger of God, and the anger of the judge, the anger of the Lord of lords, and the king of kings, he now said to the man, stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. Have you noticed that that's the action of the creator? He didn't pray. He didn't close his eyes. He didn't pray in the name of any other person. By his authority, the authority of the creator, he told the man, stand forth. And then he said, stretch forth thy hand. Yes, he gave power to the apostles. But the apostles, when they prayed, they have to say, silver and gold have I known in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Yes, he gave his power to the believers. And the believers, they can heal the sick. But how do they heal the sick? This sign shall follow them that believe in my name. You cast out devils in my name. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In his own case, he did not refer to any higher authority. He was the authority. He was the power. And he was the one that has the authority to say, stretch forth thy hand. And without any prayer at all, his sight was restored whole as the other. Look at verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway they took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Were they angry? I said, were they angry? Yes, they were angry. Look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 23. John chapter 7, verse 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me? Are ye angry at me, Pharisees? Sadducees, scribes, Sanhedrin, leaders, elders of the people, religious leaders, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every which whole on the Sabbath day? Yes, it was Sabbath day, but he had the power, the authority, is the Lord of the whole universe, the Lord of glory. Are you angry because I exercise my power as the creator? We're going to look at man's anger and grievance harmful to himself. That's point number three. Man's anger. We're seeing the Creator's anger. He has the right. We're seeing the Lord's anger. He has the right. And we're seeing the judge's anger. He has the right. But man, like you and I, man, like the Pharisees, man, like these people that wanted to destroy him, did they have the right man's anger and grievance harmful to himself? As you look at the scriptures, you find that men and women have been angry unjustly. That's not right. They have been angry from the beginning. And when they were angry, they did things that brought them under judgment. You're, you're angry, you harm yourself, you hurt yourself. Man's anger is harmful to himself. We're looking at Genesis chapter 49. I'm reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 49. I'm reading from verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitations. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret unto their assembly mine honor be not thou united for in their anger they slew a man in their anger they cut down the life of a man and in their self-will they dig down a wall cursed be their anger 
for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. They didn't get the final blessing from their father. They didn't get the final blessing from God when Jacob was about dying. Why? Their anger, their fierceness, and their cruelty. Anger brings harm and hurt to the people that have the anger. Uh, Numbers chapter 22. We're reading from verse 22. The danger of anger because it brings judgment, it brings hurt into our lives. Numbers chapter 22, verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. Look at that. God is against anger in his creatures, but he is the judge, and he knows when to get angry, and he's no respecter of persons. He had told Balaam, you must not go. And Balaam went to ask the Lord again, should I? And God said, all right, you want to go? You are bent on going, go ahead. And when he left, God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the lost church in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. You know the story. Go to verse 27. In verse 27, And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled and smote the ass with a star. Anger always pushes us to the wrong action. The ass was trying to protect the life of Balaam, and his anger rose, arose against that ass, and he smote that ass. The ass was acting as a friend, as an obedient servant, and not wanting him to be endangered. But he didn't know. Man is ignorant. When you see the actions of people, you don't know their mind, you don't know their thoughts, and you don't know the reasoning behind that action, and they're not contradicting the law of God. This ass was not contradicting any law of God. He was protecting the man, but the man did not understand, and he smote him. Many times in our relationship when something happens, you don't know it's protecting you, preserving you and serving you and they do something with good intention but then you smite them in anger that anger like the anger of Balaam is condemned by the Lord in verse 28 and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam what have I done unto thee that thou hast meeting me these three times and Balaam said Unto, unto the ass because that was much me. That's misinterpretation. That's why you get angry. You misinterpret the look of other people, the quietness of other people, the language of other people, the posture of other people. It's misunderstanding of the actions of people that make men angry. When you misunderstand, look at what the ass has done. The ass had a good intention, protecting the man. And the man said, you have mocked me. Because you have mocked me, I would, I would dare my sword in my hand. Now would I have killed you. And you know what the ass was doing? The ass saw the sword in the hand of the angel. But Balaam did not see the sword. And because of that, he wanted to avoid that sword. But Balaam did not know. How many times have you got angry at people? Because you didn't see judgment was coming upon you. A blemish was going to come upon your life. And somebody trying to protect you and shield you from that, yeah, from that difficulty. You get angry at them. And the ass said unto Balaam, am I not thine ass? Upon which thou was reading ever since I was thine, I was thine unto this day. Was I wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and he saw drawn 
in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell that and fell flat on his face until the lord opens your eyes to see why people do what they do you'll be getting angry you'll be misinterpreting and your misinterpretation of their action will be causing anger and that anger will be hurting you we're looking at a second samuel second samuel chapter three i'm reading here from verse six second samuel chapter three and we're looking at verse six and it came to pass while well, there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner, notice that name, underline that name, Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispah, and the daughter of Eiah, and Ishbosheth, the son of uh, one of the sons of Saul, said unto Abner, Wherefore? As thou gone in unto my father's concubine. This man, Abner, was a militant man and was protecting Ishbosheth and was protecting the house of Saul. But Saul, who had died, had a concubine. And now this man said, How is it you have gone in unto the concubine of my father? Look at this, verse 8. Then was Abner, tell me, very wroth, angry for the wars of Ishbosheth, and said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul, thy father, and to his brethren, and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David? that thou chargest me, you are accusing me to do today with a fault concerning this woman. The man got angry. What was he going to do now? When you get angry, you hurt yourself. You destroy yourself. The man got angry. He had been serving this man. And this man now said, but who are you going to the concubine of my father? You don't have right to do that. And he said, ah, so you have much to talk and accuse me like that. In his anger, he said, so do God to Abner. He was swearing now for himself. And more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so do I do to him to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to search up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. In his anger, he said, all right, you are by yourself. I'm going to David. All the tribes of Israel, I'm going to switch over unto David. Listen to me, that was the right thing to do. It was the will of God. But he was doing that will of God in anger. Why didn't he do that before the accusation? That you have gone to my father's concubine. You accuse me of that, you will see. I'm going to translate the whole kingdom into the hands of David. And so he went to David. And when he got to David, he said, David, you have my word. I'm going to translate all the tribes unto you. Doing well, doing right, but doing it in anger. Look at verse 27. And when Abner was returned to Hori, Hebron, Hebron, Job took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Joab, the captain of the army of David, knew that Abner had come and he had translated, he wanted to get all of Israel unto him. But you know, because of anger, because of anger, maybe sometimes you even know what to do, but you are not doing it because, uh, you know, you're on the other side. 
but now something happened you got angry you see in your anger you say now i'm going to do after all this is the right thing after all this is the word of god but you are doing that in anger the man did that and he lost his life you will not lose your life in anger you know there are people you jump but you jump in anger there are people you run but you run in anger there are people maybe you preach but you preach in anger there are people you can quote the right word and say the right thing but you do it in anger anger will hurt you whatever is the result of that action the anger behind the action will hurt you look at verse 31 verse 33 in verse 33 it says and the king lamented over Abner and said died Abner as a fool dies died Abner as a fool dies where does that person go is angry and then he has done something but he's not doing that thing for the glory of God he's doing it because of his anger that is propelling him and he dies in that condition he dies as a fool you will not die as a fool look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and I'm reading here from verse from verse 8 Ecclesiastes chapter 7 we're reading from verse 8 better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit be not hasty in thy spirit to be tell me are you there be not hasty in the spirit to be angry. You know, there are people, uh, we're carrying something. They don't know why we're carrying it. They don't know why we're carrying it. They're angry already. There are people, we're getting something done. They are not patient enough to understand where we're going, where we're coming from, why we're doing what we're doing. They get angry. Be patient and be meek and be gentle. Anger should not be the mark of the heart of the life of a real child of God. For anger rests in the bosom of fools. That will not be you. Anger will not be your heart. Anger will not be your bosom. We're looking at Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Did you notice that in our Bible reading tonight? Psalm 106, verse 32. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes, because they provoked his spirit, so that he spake unadvisedly with his leaves. I'm sure you know the story. There was no water to drink. And instead of going to Moses in the normal way, they came in the wrong way. The way they always came, grumbling, complaining. And then Moses got offended. He was provoked. He was the leader. You know, sometimes in leadership, you think, you have a right to be angry. The babies, perpetual babies, you have a right to be angry. Anger will bring hurt and harm to the one who delights in that anger. And eventually, he went to the Lord. That's still good. So far, so good. And God said, go to the rock and speak to that rock. And water will come out for them. And then he came out and he was angry his spirit was provoked and you need to be careful in your life your ministry in your local church your ministry in your church in the state or in the region or maybe at the headquarters that you are not it's not your law that the people have to obey it's the law of god 
If they do wrong, it's to God. If they disobey, it's to God. If they disregard the law of God, it's to God. Leave that in the hands of God. If there's going to be anger against anyone, let it be the right of the Almighty God that He can judge the people that disobey Him. It's not our right as leaders. To get provoked and then to become angry, it says in verse 33, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his leaves. You know what happened? He couldn't get to the physical land of promise. Thank God he went to heaven. How do we know he got to heaven? Because he was there on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ and with Elijah. We know he got to heaven. How do we know he got to heaven? The redeemed of God in heaven are singing the songs of the Lamb and the song of Moses. But he could not see the fruit of his work, of his labor, of his 40 years of labor. He could not see that over here on earth. Anger will not destroy you. Anger will not make you to miss what the Lord has provided for you in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry, pastor, that whosoever is angry, worker, and that whosoever is angry, members of the church, and that whosoever is angry, anyone, whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, abusive word, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool, shall be in danger of, tell me, tell me out aloud. Why are we going to waste our lives coming to church every time, reading the Bible every time, coming to the Bible study every time, and walking for the Lord, running errands for the Lord, going up and down, sweating, and spending our money, and spending our lives, and then just because of this habitual anger that, you know, this has happened, and that has happened, you are angry. And Jesus said, those who say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You know why people get angry? You think about it. All, they're not even thinking of the laws of God. It's not that they have seen that somebody that is calling the name of God in vain. They have not seen someone blaspheming the name of the Lord. They have not seen somebody respecting their parents. They have not seen somebody in adultery, fornication, or stealing. They get angry because of their own law. They are placed on people. And when people are not obeying their own law, they get angry. Where there is no law, there is no sin. If you don't have any extra law, any other regulation, if all you are looking for is a teach the word of God, that's the law of God. If the people obey the law of God, they get to heaven after they have the grace of God and they are saved. If they don't obey the law of God, it's not in your hand, it's God they have offended. But people get angry because of their own laws that we are not complying with. Remove that law. Remove that tradition. Where there's no law you place for anybody on your wife, on your husband, or your children, or your parents, say, Lord, that is not in the word of God. They didn't do it this way. They need it that way. They didn't uh, dot my eye and cross my teeth. Forget about yourself. And remove all those laws you are putting down. And there will be no anger because there's nothing to be angry about. Because if we're continuing that habit, if we continue in that lifestyle of anger, 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 it says we'll be in danger of hell fire. I pray you'll not go to hell. I, will, I know I will not go to hell. I said I will not go to hell. You know, I'm trying to protect somebody to get to heaven. And then I get angry. And he gets to heaven. 
and the man who is trying to, you know, do everything so that they don't misbehave, they don't get to hell, and so they live right, and then he says all these laws and all these uh, restrictions and everything, he himself, anger, 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 does not get to heaven. I see you want to be a bus conductor. You're getting late, come in. You're getting late, come in. Go in there, go in there, go in there. And then you pack the bus board and the bus is gone. And in your anger, you couldn't make it. I will make it. Somebody there, I will make it. Forget about all the other things. And forget about other people. Hear the word of God and obey the word of God. And don't let anger destroy your life. You will not be destroyed. I'm coming to Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Is that possible? I said, is it possible? God never gives us a commandment we cannot obey. It's possible. When you cancel all the laws and all the yoke you bring on people, and when you don't care whether they obey your own law or not, and you only take care that they obey the law of God, and it says in that way, there will be no bitterness in your life, let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, and all clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another. Where there's no law, there's no sin. Don't raise up another law. Don't raise up another regulation. And if you don't have any other law except the law of God, you're not going to be angry with people. You'll be kind. You'll be tender-hearted. And even when they have done wrong and they have offended God, you'll be pleading for them and praying for them that God will forgive them and give them salvation and give them freedom from sin. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Has God forgiven you? Somebody there, has God forgiven you? Does God love you? Does God show mercy on you? Even as God has forgiven you, so forgive other people. As we conclude, anger leads to the hardening of hearts. In your family, you're angry and angry and angry. It will harden the hearts of your children. They do their best. Even your wife, she does her best. You still have something to complain about. It will harden that woman. Okay, that's who I am. I cannot do better. Anger hardens people. It results in hardening of hearts. Anger leads to hatred. In homes, in your house, in your home, anger, 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 it will lead to hatred. And the children will be saying, I'm waiting for the time I'll be old enough to live by myself. I'm not going to live with this man. I'm not going to live under this woman. I'm not going to go to their church with them. Anger brings up hatred in the home. Anger hurts your health. Anger hurts your health. You'll be weak. Physically, you'll have hypertension. And your body will be shaking with anger. You'll destroy yourself and die before your time. You will not die before your time. Anger brings humiliation to the high-minded. Nebuchadnezzar, that man was angry. I have a dream. I have forgotten that dream. All my words may come. It will bring the dream unto me. And they said, tell us the dream. We'll give you interpretation. Nobody had forgotten. There's nobody, there's no king on earth that ever demands anything like that from anybody. We cannot tell you. You yourself, you had a dream and you have forgotten. And a man was angry. He said, we'll kill all the wise men until Daniel came to their rescue. Anger brings humiliation to the high-minded. That's the man that was turned to an animal eventually. Anger brings 
hindrance to holiness. You have prayed. Maybe some of us who have fasted, I'll be holy. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And many things are taken care of in that holiness of life. But now, anger, anger. This one has happened, that one has happened. I'm not happy at this, I'm not happy at that. Anger will hinder your holiness. You'll not be able to see God. Anger halts you on the highway to heaven. Anger will halt you. You'll stay there. You'll be grinding something in your heart. I'm angry. At that one, I'm angry. You don't even know him. At that one, I'm angry. He resists his hand, you're angry. He bows now, you're angry. He shouts, you're angry. He keeps quiet, you're angry. Anger will halt your journey on the highway to heaven. Anger will lead you to the horrors of hell. The torment in hell. An angry man, an angry woman, he's sick, he's dying. His habit of anger is still there. And as he's passing on, he's remembering, this one did not come to visit me in the hospital. This one did not come to help me. This one did not help me at all. And he's remembering all the members of the church that should have come. He's a dying man on the sick bed. And he's still angry. And he dies in that anger. And he passes on to the horrors of hell. Anger is a serious sin. Today, it will be ejected out of every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Man's anger and grievance brings harm to himself. We have seen today how the Pharisees, uh, how they acted. We have seen today how these uh, Pharisees, how they were looking for accusation. Because they had grudge. They were hypocrites blinded by hatred. Tell the Lord you'll not be like that and live your life free. Your life in love. Your life in mercy. That the anger of the Pharisees will not destroy your life. Anger of religious people will not destroy your life. The anger and the grief of Jesus is Lord. Is King. Lord of lords and king of kings. You cannot say I'm angry because I'm copying Jesus. No, you cannot copy Jesus. He's much higher than you are. Lion of the tribe of Judah. And then the anger of man. The anger of man. The anger of man. That brings the horrors of hell on people. Tell the Lord today that the Lord will set you free and cleanse you. I make you loving, meek, gentle, kind, tender-hearted.